The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea, Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, the, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Throughout this past week, I spent time, as I usually do, sitting with these lessons and listening for what they might be saying to me, to us, and what it was that I should be hearing. And in the midst of that, I heard, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, I heard these, these concerns about identity. And beyond identity, also concerns about discipline whether it be in James where we heard about the need to discipline the tongue <laughs> about what we say during the gospel lesson the call to discipline as disciples but there are other things that we're going on with yet in the mind is that the evangelism committee was going to meet. Now, one of the things about the evangelism committee is that we're reading a book together. It's a book called The Evangelizing Church. Um, and as I read the chapter, we came to the end. This chapter was written by uh, a pastor, a, a faculty member at one of the ELCA seminaries who was talking about some of the hard questions that we as a church need to be thinking about because of the context that we're in. And those questions have to do with being in a plural culture where there's not just one religion and there's not just one worldview and there's not just one way of being. And how do we respond to that? And in the end, towards the end of this chapter, the author wrote, what the churches should strive toward is the formation of local communities of authentic disciples embodying the cruciform pattern of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Now, what does that mean? That we as a church should be a place that builds up and strengthens and upholds people so that they can grow into discipleship to become disciples. And when we are truly disciples, that we follow the reality of Jesus Christ. It is a reality that Jesus talks about when he's talking to his disciples this morning. But that's not the only thing I came across. I was, I was reading, and actually I finally finished Diana Butler Bass's book, Christianity After Religion. 
And frankly, it's been a very challenging book for me because it calls me to think about being and doing things in ways that I'm not so sure I'm ready to be and do as church. As we came towards the end of her summary, she writes, churches must grasp in a profound and authentic way that they are sacred communities. Sacred communities of performance where the faithful learn the script of God's story, rehearse the reign of God, experience delight, surprise, and wonder, and then participate fully in the play. She's using the metaphor of a, of a stage play, if you will where the role of the church is for us as individuals to come together and learn God's story, learn the script in such a way that it becomes a part of us. But we don't just learn the stories, we also rehearse them. And so as we gather here today, we rehearse God's story. We hear it proclaimed. And then we gather around this table where the reign of God gets practiced because there is enough for everyone. Because in God's kingdom, there is enough. But lest we get caught up in thinking that this serious business is so serious that we have to absolutely be, I don't know, she says the third piece of this is that we should be people who are also filled with joy and delight and wonder. Because when we enter into this space, then we also start to find ways that, that God is active and giving us life. And in the end, all of this leads us to a place where we are able to each and every one of us, from the very youngest to the very oldest, independent of any of the things that generally we use to separate us, we all participate fully in what God is up to in this place, in God's creation. Finally, last week I was introducing a, a framework Work that comes out of Vibrant Faith Ministries. It's, a, it's an organization of Minnesota that, that is working on helping congregations partner with homes, with our home life as families to develop environments where children can grow in faith. And last week I talked about the, the four practices that can be involved at home so that we create an environment where our children will catch the faith. But this week I found myself pondering the next thing on their framework and that was three characteristics of Christian disciples. The first one is authentic. The next one is available. And the final one is affirming. So in their framework, from their research, what is discipleship is to be people who are authentic. But when we are being authentic, we are also available to those people who have need, available to others. It's not just about us. And finally, in the midst of that, we are affirming and supportive, uh, supportive of one another another way of talking about showing God's love to one another. Somehow in the midst of that, I started to hear this, what is going on that in everything that I'm reading, I keep coming across this authentic thing, this call to authenticity. And I started to remember that over the past 10, 15 years, I've heard lots of calls that we be authentic. Now, what does that mean? 
I have heard young people in our church and in other churches talk about that sometimes when they look around, they hear the church say one thing, but then when it does, doesn't seem to match up with what we say we believe. Perhaps that's what it means to be authentic, is when what we say and what we do matches up. Perhaps one other way of understanding authentic is to be real, <laughs> right? Genuine, the real article. Now, I'm not sure what to do with that, except as I started to think about this story that we hear today, what I hear and started to remember is that over we are now at the very end of the first half of Mark's Gospel. And for that first half of Mark's Gospel, what has been going on is, first Jesus comes on the scene, he's baptized, he announces the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. And then he starts calling disciples and he starts healing and he starts teaching and he feeds those 4,000 and those 5,000 and he calms the seas and he does all of these incredible things. And in the midst of that, these people start gathering around him and following him. And even when he wants to get away for a while and rest because he knows he needs it, they find him. He can't go without being noticed. And he keeps giving them what they need. But one of the things I started to notice is that up until this point, he hasn't really expected anything of them. So part of what I encounter today is in the course of our hearing, Jesus gets real. And what he thought about, first of all, who do people say that I am? Of course, there are all kinds of guesses. Oh, you're John the Baptist. Oh, you're Elijah. You're one of the prophets. And he says, no, 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 no. Okay, as disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds for all of us, doesn't he? You are the Messiah. And Jesus goes on to say, and of course, what did... Peter think? What did good Jewish folks think when they started to talk about the Messiah? They were expecting a very particular kind of person. They were expecting somebody who was going to come and restore the glory that they had known in the past. They were thinking of somebody who was going to bring them back to some kind of communal purity. They were thinking about somebody who was going to reestablish Israel in its rightful place among nations at a, at a relatively high level, right? They were expecting a restoration to holiness. And if you really boil it down, they were expecting David to come back. That great, mighty, military guy and political leader who could unite the kingdoms and bring everything together. And oh, by the way, if somebody was a threat to them, he could also deal with it. You may have your own words for what that looks like. And what does Jesus say? He starts to offer a corrective. And the corrective goes something like this. No, what the Messiah means is that I will undergo betrayal and suffering at the hands of the very leaders who should be about God's kingdom. And... I will be killed, and I will, on the third day, rise. Now, Peter and the gang, but Peter takes initiative for all of us and says, no, 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 that can't possibly be what this is going to look like. You're wrong. Heaven forbid. And Jesus says, you're focusing on the wrong things. And he starts to teach the whole community, right? If any want to follow me, this is what it's going to look like. And what is it going to look like? 
It means that we're going to set aside our own hungers and desires and seek to care for our neighbor. We're going to love our neighbors. We're going to enter into and engage in this life of caring for the other. For the sake of the good news. Remember, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Be of a changed mind. Be transformed. Be changed. Let go of all those things that hold you and that you too easily cling to. And then follow me. And where does following him lead? Well, first of all, it leads to a wonderful mountaintop experience where James and John and Peter gather up there with Jesus and there's Moses and Elijah with Jesus and they, whoa, this is cool. Let's set up camp. And Jesus says, no, this isn't where it's at. We go down into the valley. And he went down in the valley and he healed more people and he taught more and he headed right into Jerusalem to where the conflict was, where sure enough, he was betrayed and he suffered and he died and he was raised. We are invited into this very pattern of living. We are invited as disciples to follow that. Why? Because it is the path of life. So in the midst of this, what happens is all of a sudden it gets real. It's not just following this miracle worker. But we have what Diana Butler Bass points to, an opportunity to, first of all, learn the story, and second of all, to rehearse it, to practice that which we struggle with, and then we have an invitation to find ways to, to be joyful in the midst of it, because when we encounter what God is up to, all of a sudden, joy is not that hard. And finally, in the end, what happens is we all have a place. We all have a responsibility. We all are disciples who are called to participate in God's reign. Being a disciple is not a spectator sport. We all are called to participate, and when we do, that's when it gets real.